Occupational hazards. Occupational hazards are obvious for people who work in certain occupations. On high-rise construction, for example, or on a police force or at a nuclear plant. But there are hazards in the quieter professions as well. Pity the poor accountant. We have one over here. <laughs> who can't help keeping a running record of everything in his life, totaling the cost of all the spoiled milk and the unread newspapers. The lawyer who sees nothing but lawsuits wherever she turns, or the poor shopkeepers, whatever shops they keep, they all fall victim to their own goods. Dave's friend, Dorothy Capper, has bought so many books from her own bookstore that she can barely fit a guest into her guest bedroom. <laughs> Kenny Wong, who runs a cafe down the block, Wong's Scottish Meat Pies. <laughs> I've always liked that one, too. <laughs> Kenny can't resist a deal on a case of produce. And then there's Dave owner of a second-hand record store. Dave spends a good quarter of his working life poking around flea markets and garage sales, church basements and record shows, making him vulnerable to what might be the most insidious occupational hazard in the world, the impulse purchase. <laughs> you set yourself loose in the sort of places that Dave frequents, and see if you don't come home with the odd lava lamp, <laughs> abused pair of cowboy boots, or, as Dave did on a snowy Monday last November, a sensory deprivation tank. <laughs> a few days after it arrived, he was over at Kenny Wong's cafe, sitting on his regular stool at the end of the counter, poking at a bowl of Kenny's rice pudding. He hadn't told anyone about the tank yet, but he's about to tell Kenny because he needs Kenny's help. He finishes his dessert, and he looks over at Kenny and says, where do you get your salt anyway? And Kenny waves at the cupboard behind the counter, and Dave says, no, 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 I mean, where do you buy your salt? Who supplies you? Kenny says, you looking for a deal? <laughs> How much salt do you want? Kenny thought they were kidding around. Dave says, oh, about 800 pounds. <laughs> okay, now, if you are feeling unsure about something, something that you have done as Dave was, if you are feeling shy or uncertain about how others might accept it, chances are when you share your secret, your story is going to drift from the realm of information exchange into the world of hyperbole and justification and rationalization. <laughs> Kenny said, you need 800 pounds of salt? Dave said, it's uh, for my float tank. Kenny said, you're kidding, right? And Dave took flight. <laughs> Floating, he said. A well, floating is like a return to the womb. You get into a float tank and close the soundproof lid, you're going to float away on water denser than the Dead Sea. He leaned forward and he looked at Kenny dramatically. For the first time in your life, your brain will be free of stimulation and stress. Kenny didn't say anything. Dave said, one hour in a tank is as good as four hours of sleep. He's just making things up now. We get two hours in there, said Dave, and he's waving his spoon in the air. We wouldn't need to sleep at all. <laughs> Think of everything we could get done. <laughs> we, said Kenny. <laughs> Think of all the extra time we'd have if we didn't have to sleep, said Dave. Kenny cocked his head and looked at his friend, and he said, you know, you never struck me like a guy who was exactly short of time. Okay, there's something else I have to tell you before we go any further. Dave has a touch of claustrophobia. 
And as enticing as he made it sound, as enticing as it might be, the thought of floating in the dark coffin-like capsule terrified him. What if he fell asleep and flipped over and drowned? Or worse, what if he went insane and came out stark, grave, and mad? Maybe he'd find the inner peace that they talked about online, or maybe he'd come out convinced that he could talk to shrubbery. Oh, Dave wanted to get into that tank, but what he really wanted was for Kenny to take it out on a test drive first. Which is why he was laying it on so thick. And it worked. Before lunch was over, Kenny wanted to try it too. So off they went, and they bought 16, 16 50-pound bags of salt. And they threw them into the back of Kenny's truck, and they drove the truck over to Dave's store, and they unloaded the salt into the back storage room where he had the float tank. And a week later, early on a Friday morning, They hooked up a hose to the sink in the washroom of Dave's store and ran it across the hallway and filled the tank with tepid water. It took all day for the salt to dissolve. Just before four that afternoon, Dave called Kenny. It's ready, he said. And Kenny came over, and he changed in the washroom, and he darted across the hall with his belly protruding over his speedo. Why? That's not how you see Kenny? That's how I saw Kenny. (laughs) Kenny changed in the washroom, and he darted across the hall with his sleek, ripped body rippling in the light. Whatever you need, I'm here to please. Whoa, said Dave, you've been working out? (laughs) Can we get back to the story, said Kenny? (laughs) And then he climbed into the tank. And he lowered himself into the water. It's not hard, he said. It wasn't hard at all. It was just like lying on a bed, except wetter. (laughs) Kenny said, close the lid. I want the total experience. So Dave closed the door, and he stood there beside the tank in the suddenly silent room. And he could feel his heart starting to pound, and his Palms begin to sweat, his breath coming fast and shallow. He, he was feeling the first symptoms of sympathetic claustrophobia. <laughs> After five uncertain minutes, he tapped on the lid of the tank. You okay? You okay? Did he hear a muffled okay from inside the tank? It's hard to tell. It was like talking to a can of peas. Five more minutes, and he tapped again, this time as hard as he could. And this time, Kenny opened the door, and he stuck his head out, blinking, looking looking like the dormouse in the teapot from Alice in Wonderland, also looking peevish. I I was just checking, said Dave. Kenny said, well, I was just letting go. I'm not going to be able to get into this if you keep interrupting. And so, feeling a little reassured and a little foolish, Dave turned off the storage room light, shut the door, and left. (laughs) Some of us see trouble coming. Kenny ducked down again and closed the tank door like he was getting into a submarine. Settling onto his back in the warm water, his arms and legs extended as if he were making a snow angel. And a half hour went by. 
and then another. Dave cracked the door and peeked in at some point. He wanted to knock again on the tank, but he didn't. Inside, where it was dark and soundless, Kenny was still floating on his back in the soft, salty water. But Kenny was beginning to feel like he had floated long enough. When things go wrong, <laughs> when nuclear plants melt down or buses full of the faithful leave the road, when disasters happen, that is, it's seldom the result of some big thing. It's always a chain of simple things, almost all of them avoidable. Kenny reached up in the darkness and felt around for the handle to open the tank door. The door didn't budge. He pushed harder. Still nothing. Outside, a mere foot from his head, Brian, who works part-time at Dave's store, dropped another milk crate of records on top of the tank. <laughs> Brian is used to strange things popping up in Dave's store. A huge paper mache sculpture of Frank Sinatra. A rusting phone booth, once even a coffin. No one had said anything to Brian about a flotation tank. He put the crate of records down on the lid and he went back into the store to get the next one. Now, you would think that it would be impossible for Dave to forget Kenny. <laughs> but that just wouldn't be any fun, would it? You would think that Kenny would be all that Dave would be thinking of that afternoon, but we all forget things. Sometimes important things. It happens when other things come up. And things had been coming up all afternoon. A fella had walked into the store with seven milk crates of soul albums to sell. One of Stephanie's old friends had come in looking for a birthday present for her father. And then, Right before closing, Morley phoned to remind Dave that they were going to dinner at the Lowbeers. <laughs> and he promised he wouldn't be late. And now, he was. In his rush, he just forgot. <laughs> he locked up and he laughed as simple as that. <laughs> leaving Kenny in the tank, cursing like a sailor. Dave remembered him two hours later. <laughs> he was sitting at the Lowbeer's dining room table. Gerda carried in four beautiful fillets of cod. I cooked them sous vide, she said, which means sealed in plastic and immersed in warm water. <laughs> it's quite remarkable, said Gerda. You leave anything in warm water long enough, it'll eventually cook. Dave stared at his piece of fish and said something unspeakably inappropriate. And then he jumped up and ran out the front door without a word. Gerda watched him go, poked at her cod, and then looked at Morley and Carl and said, Mine looks fine to me. But Dave was already out of earshot. Dave was pounding down the dark neighborhood streets, racing back to his shop. When he got there, he rushed toward the back room, praying that what he was going to find was a transformed and mellow Kenny Wong. <laughs> what he found was $500 worth of salt and water leaking through the floorboards and crates of records scattered everywhere, and a noticeable absence of Kenny. Dave gave Wong's Scottish meat pies a wide berth for a day or two. <laughs> but after a few days, he knew he had to face the music. And so he screwed up his courage 
and he headed for Kenny's cafe. He went early and found Kenny all alone, behind the counter, unloading the dishwasher. Dave sat down on his regular stool, last one in the row, and he said, I, I, I guess you've been wondering where I be. <laughs> Kenny shrugged. Dave said, well, I'm here to apologize. Kenny was unexpectedly gracious. He turned and picked up the coffee pot from the warmer on the counter behind him. He poured a mug of coffee and set it down in front of Dave. Nothing to worry about, he said. All's well, it ends well. And then he looked up and down the countertop. Hey, he said, could you grab me a basket of creamers? And Dave got up from his stool and he headed for the big walk-in fridge. <laughs> Too bad Dave doesn't spend more time in Calgary. He'd, <laughs> he's not quite as quick as you. He couldn't believe this was going so well. The creamers were at the back of the cooler. He walked in and stepped over a crate of lettuce and around a box of tomatoes, and he reached for them, and that is when he heard the big cooler door click shut behind him. He walked back and he reached for the handle with a sinking heart. Just as he expected, it was locked. <laughs> what he didn't expect was the envelope with his name on it taped to the inside of the door. <laughs> it was a sympathy card. <laughs> Thinking of you in your times of trouble. Inside, Kenny had written, Don't worry, I won't forget you. <laughs> Dave had just enough time to read that before the fridge light snapped out. <laughs> and he sighed. He knew this was coming. He sat down on the tomatoes to wait it out. They'd always made it clear, you should forgive your enemies. But no one ever said anything about your friends. <laughs>